This evening, this evening, we're going to do a little charting. We want to chart the, dy the dynamics of the struggle for enlightenment because that surfaces what we call the mystery. This is going to be drawn from Taplow's Three Pillars of Zen. And once you see how it's done, you should be able to apply it to any person's efforts to secure something profound and meaningful. As long as they talk in the first person, as long as they talk out of their experience. Now, what I'd like to do is to introduce a hypothesis, and the hypothesis is this. If this arrow can represent that quest for enlightenment that starts here, and the person, of course, may have some various ups and downs along the way, But the hypothesis we're going to introduce is called the parallel hypothesis. Now, what I mean by this curious term, the parallel hypothesis, is that when we chart a person's ups and downs, we are really charting two things. We're charting the way in which they describe their struggles to achieve enlightenment, but we're also going to get a description of these peculiar dips and turns that people have when they try to do anything meaningful and significant. So the parallel hypothesis saying, says that while you're going along on one trail, consciously, the quest for enlightenment, you are actually going also on another quest. And that is, all right, and that is, a parallel movement. And I'm going to call that out of the trap of one's existence. And that too has its ups and downs, you see. So while we're interested in understanding the struggles a person had to secure enlightenment, we're, we're going to be also interested in this other level, how they free themselves out of what we're going to call the trap of, of one's own existence. Now, what do I mean by that? That means that the higher you go up, the more you're going to have to face another level of your existence <clears throat> that you're ignorant of. This is a conscious quest. This one is mysterious. And you'll never, you will never come to grips with that mysterious part of your existence unless you struggle for something that's personally significant to you. Then you bump into this parallel problem. So that, let us say they are stages here that a person is able to work their way through. Wherever they experience a psychological condition that blocks them, 
that block, such as here, right, puts them into a negative state and they plunge into a world of feelings and confusion. And what we want to understand is how those two levels are related. That's where we're going. Now, what do we mean by the trap of one's own existence? There's a boundary to our existence. Right now. There's a boundary, a psychic boundary around us. And you can't get out. You're trapped in it. We call it existence because it's something that came, that developed as part of your own way of living. It had an origin and it can have a decline. So it's caught in this world of existence. Existence is the world of things that come in and pass out of existence. That's different than being. So while there's a boundary to our existence, this quest for enlightenment and meaning is to break through this, you see, to break through this. That's what we want to do, break through this. And if we can, then we experience a sense of freedom, freedom and openness of what is called being. Now, We're going to make this search by following the words, the logos. We'll conclude about a person's state of mind from the metaphors and words they use to describe themselves. So, let's do it together. I'm now in Three Pillars of Zen, the Canadian housewife. I think everyone has a copy. Now we have six pages to read through. And as we read it through, I'm going to highlight certain things. And the way I'm going to sketch this is to say that as a person's powers of concentration increase, so their progress has a parallel increase. As a student or person can uh, be guided in this journey and take advantage of a guidance, to that degree as well there can be development. Well, you see, if a person now has powers of concentration, they can be guided by another party, and therefore they can then pursue this game, then we should be able to get a kind of description of those particular experiences and locate them in some way on this graph we're going to make. So let me give you an example of what I mean by it. I'm on page 272. All the first day of the session, I found it virtually impossible to keep my mind steady. The comings and goings of other participants, as well as the noise and the confusion occasioned by the use of the kyosaku, were a source of constant interference. That's the stick. When I complained to the Roshi how much better my zazen had been alone in my own home, he instructed me to pay no attention to the others and pointed out how important it was to learn to meditate in distracting circumstances. At no time during the session, however, was I hit with a kyosaku. I found it so distracting at the previous session that the Roshi had given instructions that it was not to be used on me. That's the first day. How are her powers of concentration? She's confused, right? So therefore, I'm going to put this, I'm going to call this a, and I'm going to call this B, and therefore I'd say her powers of concentration on the first day are very weak. And would you not agree, uh, 
she's not following the Roshi's advice. <clears throat> she's trying to get the Roshi to follow her advice. So I'll put both A and B low on the first day. By the end of the second day, my concentration had grown steadier. I had no longer had great pain in my legs, and the cold was bearable with all the clothing I had brought. There was, however, a problem, which for me took on more and more significance. I had been told repeatedly to put my mind in the pit of my abdomen, or more, more exactly in the region below the navel. The more I tried to do this, the less I understood what it was about the bottom of the abdomen which made the spot so significant. It had been called by the Roche a center of focus. But for me, this was meaningful only in a philosophical way. Now, I was to put my mind in this philosophical spot and to keep repeating, moo. I found no relationship between any of the organs of the admin and the process of Zen meditation, much less enlightenment. The Roshi, it is true, had assigned me the koan mu after satisfying himself of my earnest desire for self-realization and had instructed me as to its purpose and its use. Nevertheless, I was still perplexed about how to say mu. Earlier, I had tried considering it the same as the Indian mantra om, endeavoring to be one with its vibration and without questioning what mu was. Now I began to conceive of mu as a diamond at the end of a drill and, and of myself as a driller working through layers of the mind which I pictured as a geological strata and through which I was eventually to emerge into something I knew not what. Well, look here. Concentration is certainly increasing, isn't it? So I'm going to put A higher. But is she following the Roshi or is she taking her own advice? Right. So I'm going to give her a poor grade for B. So you can certainly develop concentration and have some progress in concentration without necessarily following the Roshi's advice, as we can see. Third day. On the morning of the third day, I was truly concentrated, guided by the drilling analogy. I can now focus my mind somewhere in my abdomen without, however, knowing just where. And there was a growing rock-like stability to my sitting by mid-morning. Just after the Roshi's lecture, I settled into a fairly deep concentration, increasing the force of each breath which, which uh, had been synchronized with the repetition of Mu. I expected this increase of effort to strengthen the concentration even further. After some 15 minutes, the combination of this forceful breathing and the repetition of Mu began to produce a strange tingling in my wrists, which spread slowly downward to the hands and the fingers as well as upward to the elbows. When this sensation had gotten well underway, I recognized it as identical to what I had experienced under severe emotional shock on several occasions of my life. I told myself that if I increased even further the force of my breathing and concentration, I might come to Kensho. I did this and succeeded only in worsening the situation. Finally reaching a fainting state just before this state erupted, I began to feel the most profound and agonizing sorrow with which came violent shivering spasms and gnashing of my teeth. Nervous paroxysm shook my body again and again. I wept bitterly and writhed as, a, as though a torrent of electricity were surging through me. Then I began to perspire profusely. I felt the sorrows of the entire universe were tearing me at my abdomen, and I was being sucked into the vortex of unbearable agonies. Sometime after, I can't say how long. I remember my husband ordering me to stop zazen, lie down, rest. I collapsed into my cushion, began sh to shiver. My hands were now quite still, neither my fingers sticking out at odd angles, nor my elbows would bend. My head whirled and I lay exhausted. Slowly the nerves relaxed. In half an hour, all had subsided. My energies had returned and in all respects I was ready to resume zazen. Okay. A certainly increases. How about following the Roshi? 
How's she doing? She's able to uh, s settle into a deep concentration by focusing on the breath and in the abdomen, but she's still repeating mu, isn't she? And synchronizing it. And synchronizing it. That's an additional thing, isn't it? She's still dealing with the drilling now. Yeah. Listen to her husband, Pardon me? Listen to her husband. Yes, yes, yes. Now, do you see about six lines from the bottom? When this sensation had gotten well underway, I recognized it as identical to what I had experienced under severe emotional shock on several occasions of my life. Now look here. Hey, that brought her to recognize a, uh, what are we gonna call it? I don't wanna use the word, uh, experience because we're already using E for enlightenment. So I'm going to call it a traumatic event of her past. Would you agree, as her concentration increased, something happened? <whistles> Down she went. Down she went. So, If up, why the down? Now we can add to that. Why the down and why the recollection, the flash, that she recognized she had experienced this before in the past several times, right? So she's able to fasten on to past and recollect certain past scenes. And she knows that uh, they recurred. They, look here, you see, it's as if the more profound you go up in your progress in this concentration enlightenment game, the more it's going to surface traumatic events of your past. Now, it, now I don't, let's see, of traumatic episodes, events suggest that it's external. Episodes. That leaves it neutral. All right, now look. She gets on her cushion, she relaxes, she's ready to go again. At the afternoon, Dokusan, the Roshi, immediately asked what had happened. When I told him, he said it was a, a makyo, and to keep on doing zazen, such things could happen from now, from now on, he warned. They showed my meditation was deepening. So he's aware of the fact that that kind of phenomena takes place. He then instructed me to search for Mu in the region below the solar plexus, with the words solar plexus, suddenly everything fell into position. For the first time I knew exactly where I was going and what I was to do. The next morning on the fourth day I awakened with the bell at 4 a.m., found that I had not separated myself from Mu even while asleep, which is what the Roshi had continually urged. During the first sitting period before morning Dokusan, the previous day's symptoms began to appear. This time, however, telling uh, myself it was only a macchio, I kept right on, determined to ride it out. Gradually, however, the paralysis descended into my legs as well, and I could just hear my husband say in the distance somewhere that I was in a trance. I thought my body might begin to uh, levitate, but still I kept on with my zazen. Then I fell over helpless and lay still by the time I was well enough to resume, morning Dokusan was over. Gradually, however, the paralysis descended into my legs as well, and I could just hear my husband in the distance somewhere saying that I was in a trance. I thought my body might begin to, to levitate, but I kept on doing the zazen. I fell over helpless, lay still, morning Dokusan was over. Look here. Now is she following the Roshi? 
Yes. Ah, so she's following the Roche. See? The, um, um, this is the morning of the fourth day, you see. And she's now focused, she's working, working, going higher, following the Roshi. And what happens again? Crash. Crash again. I began to consider that I must be doing something wrong, misdirecting my energies in some way. During the rest period after the morning lecture, I suddenly realized that this center where I was being told to put my mind could only be a certain region long familiar to me. From early childhood, it was the realm to which I always had always retired inwardly. In order to reflect, I had built up a whole set of intimate images about it. If ever I wanted to understand the truth of a situation, it was to this particular area that I must go to consider such problems, which had to be approached in a childlike frame of mind, free from prejudice. I would simply hold my mind there and be still, almost without breathing, until something coalesced. This, I believed, was the region the Roshi intended. Intuitively, I divined it, and with all my energy, scented Mu there. In perhaps half an hour, a warm stop, spot began to grow in my abdomen, slowly spreading to my spine and gradually creeping up the spine column. This was what I had been striving for. Now, look here. Right? We're now on the fourth day. She recognizes the instructions, fits something that she has known her whole life. So now she gets a recollection. Right? We're going to call that R. She gets a recollection. Right? She gets a recollection. The recollection of, of her past. And we're going to go back to that section in a little while. Highly related to the next Okusan, which is the private interview with Roshi. I told the Roshi that I had found the spot and described its functioning to him as I had always experienced it. As I had always experienced it. See, she's re recalling. Good, he explained. Now go on, returning to my place. I threw myself into Zazen with such vigor that before long the paralysis began to manifest itself again. The severest tack yet. I could not move at all, and my husband had to help me lie down, covering me with blankets. While I lying there recuperating, I thought, my body is obviously unable to stand up to the strain I'm putting on it. If I am uh, to see and to move, it must be done with my mind alone. I must somehow restrain the physical and nervous energies, which will have to be conserved for the final effort. This time when I recovered, I tried to concentrate my mind without voicing or thinking of Mu, but found it difficult. In practice, it meant actually divorcing concentration from breathing rhythm. However, after repeated efforts, I did accomplish it, accomplish it, and I was able to hold my mind steady in my abdomen, as though staring intently at something, and just let my breathing take any rhythm it's inclined to do. The more I concentrated with my mind in the abdomen, the more thoughts like clouds arose. But they were not discursive. They were like stepping stones directing me. I jumped from one to the next, constantly moving along a well-defined path, which my own tuition, intuition bade me follow. Even so, I believe that at some point they must, they must disappear and my mind become quite empty, as I had been led to expect before Kensho. The presence of these thoughts signaled to me that I must still be far from my goal. Doing better yet, isn't she? She's doing very well, isn't she? Even better yet. Still on the fourth day. So we can even put her higher now. See, now it's a return.
In order to conserve as much energy as possible, I relaxed my posture to warm myself, pulled the blanket, which had been loose around my body, up over my head. I kept my hands, I let my hands fall limply into my lap, unlocked my legs to a loose cross-legged position. Even that small amount of energy placed at my disposal to my mind increased its concentrative intensity. The following morning at Dogosan, the fifth day, the Roshi told me I was at a critical stage and not to separate myself from Mu for a single instant. Fearing that the two remaining days and one night might not be sufficient time, I clung to Mu like a bulldog. I clung to Mu like a bulldog with its bone, so tenaciously, in fact, that bells and other signals became dim and unreal. I could no longer remember what we were supposed to do when signals sounded and had to keep asking my husband what they meant in order to keep up strength. I ate heartily at every meal and took all the rest the session schedule allowed. I felt like a child going on a strange new journey led step by step by the Roshi. That afternoon, going out for a bath, I walked down the road thinking, Moo. I began to get annoyed. What is Moo? Anyway, I asked, what in the name of heaven can it be? It's ridiculous. I'm sure there's no such thing as Moo. Moo isn't anything. I exclaimed in irritation. As soon as I said nothing, I suddenly remembered about the identity of opposites. Of course, Moo was also everything. While bathing, I thought, if Moo was everything, so it is the bathwater, so it is the soap, so it is the bathers. This insight gave me fresh impetus to my sitting when I resumed it. So she's reflecting on her experience now. She's, right, she's thinking about it, right? She's in a higher state, and that's where she's going. Each morning at about 4.30, it was the Roshi's custom to inspect and address all the sitters, using the analogy of a battle in which the forces of ignorance and enlightenment were pitted against each other. The Roshi urged us to attack the enemy with greater vigor. Now he's, he was saying, you've reached the stage of hand-to-hand -hand combat. You may use any means and any weapons. Abruptly at these words, I found myself in a dense jungle, breaking through the darkness of a thick foliage, with a great knife swinging at, at my belt in search of my enemy. This image came again and again, and I suppose that it was Mu. I, sum, I, somehow, I, I was somehow to overcome the enemy upon whom I was now closing in for the final dispatch. On the afternoon of the sixth day, now we're in the afternoon of the sixth day. She's still going on. On the afternoon of the sixth day, in my imagination, I was, be, I was again sp slashing a path through the jungle, babbling to myself and searching ahead for an opening in the darkness and waiting for the flood of light, which would mean I was at the end of my trail. Suddenly, with a burst of laughter, I realized that the only way to overcome this enemy when he appeared was to embrace him. No sooner had I thought this than the enemy materialized before me, clad in a costume of a Roman centurion. His short sword and shield raised in attack. I rushed him in joy and flung my arms about him. He melted into nothingness. At that instant, I saw the brilliant light appeared through the darkness of the jungle. It expanded and expanded. I stood staring at it, and into its center leapt the words, Mu is me. I stopped short. Even my breathing stopped. Could that be so? Yes, that's it. Mu is me, me is Mu. A veritable tidal wave of joy and relief surged through me. At the end of the next round of walking, I whispered to my husband, said, how much am I supposed to understand when I understand Mu? He looked at me closely and asked, do you really understand? I want the Roshi to test me at the next Okusan, I said. The next Okusan was some five hours away. I was impatient to know whether the Roshi would confirm my understanding. In my heart of hearts, I was certain I knew what Mu was. I finally told myself that if my answer was not accepted, I would leave Zen forever. If I was wrong, then Zen was wrong. In spite of my own certainty, however, since I was still unfamiliar with Zen expression, I felt I might not be able to respond to the Roshi's testing in appropriate Zen fashion. Dokusan finally came, and I asked the Roshi to test me. I expected him only to ask, to ask only what Mu was. Instead, he asked me, what's the length of Mu? How old is Mu? I thought these were typical Zen trick questions, and I sat silent and perplexed. The Rosie watched me closely, then told me 
that I must see Mu more clearly, that in the time remaining, I was to do zazen with the greatest possible intensity. When I returned to my place, I threw myself into zazen once more with every shred of strength. Now, there were no thoughts. I had exhausted all of them. Hour after hour, I sat and sat, thinking only move with all my mind. Gradually, the heat again rose in my spine. A hot spot appeared between my eyebrows and began to vibrate intensely. From the clouds of heat, right, from the clouds of heat rolled down my, ch my cheeks, neck, and shoulder, I believed something must surely happen. At the very least, an inner explosion. Nothing did happen except that I experienced recurring visions of myself, cross-legged, on a barren mountainside, mountainside, meditating and trudging doggedly through thronged cities in the scorching sun. At the next Okasan, I told the Roche about these visions and sensations. He told me that. He told me that a, a good way to bring this vibrating center now between the eyes back to the solar plexus was to trace a pathway for it by imagining something like honey, sweet and viscous, trickling down. He also told me not to concern myself with either of these visions or the clouds of heat, both of which were the outcome of the prodigious effort I was making. The important thing was only to concentrate steadily on Mu. After a few attempts, I was able once more to reestablish the center in the solar plexus and to continue as he had bidden me. The following day, the 7th, I went before the Roshi at Okusan once more. From the six or seven hours of continuous zazen, I was so physically exhausted I could scarcely speak. Imperceptibly, my mind, my mind had slipped into a state of unearthly clarity and awareness. I knew and I knew I knew. Gently, he began to question me. What is the age of God? Give me Mu. Show me Mu at the railroad station. Now my inner vision was completely in focus and I responded without hesitation to all his tests. After which the Roshi, my husband, who interrupted, and I all laughed joyfully together. And I explained, it's all so simple. Whereupon the Roshi told me that henceforth my practice in, in connection with succeeding koans was to be different and then explained how I was to proceed. Now look here. She had trouble for the first four days, up and down. She had two here. Roshi expects it. Here's the hypothesis, you see, that we are trapped in our own way of existing. As you struggle to get through that trap, you experience what it was like for you to struggle out of this kind of trap in your earliest years. We're trapped. When you were a child, right, younger, dependent, you experienced what it was like for you to struggle to get out of the kind of boundary trap that every family imposes on their children. Whenever they try to confide to you about what you really are, who you really are, what you should be or do. And conversely, when they try to tell you that you're no good or you can't do what you think you want to do, in either case, they're restricting you. They're trying to persuade you to stay right where you are. Or 
they might tell you that there's only a certain room within which you can move. They appear at that time so confident and so sincere as they try to persuade you to accept that trap. That to take exception to it would cause them great grief because they're giving you their best performance. Because they too were trapped. And that trap passes down through generations. Everyone is unique. Now, if you can imagine in your own life what it must have been like when you were free and open as a child and suddenly being told you're a this or a that. You are a this. You are a that. They're putting a boundary around your existence. And when you accept that, you also accept your role within that boundary. You accept a way of being. You get a role. You get a way of being. You get an attitude. You fit into the family drama. And there is one in every family. If you can possibly imagine what it was like or recall what it was like when they set the trap for you and the effect it must have had on you as a child when you walked away from those scenes where they were convincing you to accept that trap, then you see you're getting close to the power of this trap. Because the more restrictive it is, the more secure it is, the more you desire the freedom to get out and to re-experience that openness you once experienced. Every way you tried to get out as a child was blocked. All the doors and windows were sealed. Accepting your fate in that family means that you resign yourself to that kind of existence. Now, families do it in a variety of ways and has nothing to do with corporeal punishment, has nothing to do with punishment or violence or anything else like that. It has to, be, has to be done with sweet words and sincere words and the mask of sincerity. Now, remember what we said before. We said, you know what? What we're going to do is try this. We're going to conclude about this person, this woman, about her state of mind and perhaps the origin of it from the metaphor she uses to describe herself. Well, I only have one paragraph, the opening paragraph of her account. And I'd like to see if we can just stay with it and see whether we can build it. That's what I'd like to do. So. I'd like to go to the first page of the Canadian Housewife, as it's called, on page 266. And I want to see if I can get a picture of her and the trap. The early years of my life were quiet and uneventful. See it? Visualize it. Quiet, uneventful. No tragedy touched me, and my parents were devoted to the bringing up of myself and my two sisters. It could almost be called an ideal childhood by most Western standards. 
even from the first though, there were recurrent periods of despair and loneliness which used to seep up from no apparent source overflowing into streams of tears and engulfing me in the, to the exclusion of all else. At these times, the painful feeling of being entrapped was overpowering and simply to be a human being, a wretched and ignominious lot. Okay, now, here's our task. I'm just going to read one, one sentence. No tragedy touched me, and my parents were devoted to the upbringing of myself and my two sisters. Now, I'm taking the word, the metaphor, devoted. My parents were devoted They were devoted to me and my sisters. The word devoted is a religious term. They were devoted to, 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 to upbringing, to their upbringing. Right? That means they're, the way in which they were brought up has this particular aspect to it. They were devoted to it. And the whole upbringing, they were devoted to it so that no tragedy touched them. Therefore, they must have been careful to keep away any kind of tragedy. Now, I wonder whether you can speculate with me for a moment. What do you think it would have been like to have been one of those sisters where your parents are devoted? Therefore, would you not agree the thing you're devoted to, you're treating as if it were a divine figure or God? Then they are the object of devotion. Would you then expect them, therefore, to be absent most of the time? Not if they're devoted to the upbringing. Therefore, what is it likely, how do you think, therefore, they function with them? Constantly in their presence? Helping them continuously? In every way? Sparing them from any difficulties, no tragedy touched me. It could be almost be called an ideal childhood, except for that. That's what she says, doesn't she? Right. The years, early years of my life were quiet and uneventful. It could almost be called an ideal childhood by most Western standards, though they were recurrent periods of despair and loneliness. What does she want if she's lonely? What does she want? If you're lonely, what do you want? Yeah. Oh, um, an elephant. <laughs> no. Well, yeah. Oh, a buddy. A buddy, yeah. a friend, Companionship. a friend, some friends. Is that correct? But what's what might be the problem? You're a god. And what might? How might the parents relate to your friend? They're not good enough. Oh, they're not good enough for my daughters. Right. Oh. So as a consequence. Would you not agree she might, in fact, feel lonely being brought up in this way? 
if the degree of loneliness is there, right, loneliness, loneliness and despair go together, don't they? Then a despair sets in. They're trapped. She even uses the word. Even though from the first there were recurrent periods of despair and loneliness, which used to seep up from apparent, no apparent source, overflowing into streams of tears and engulfing me to the exclusion of everything else. Well, they may have been devoted to her, but did they see what they were doing? Ah, at these times, the painful feeling of being entrapped was overpowering. See, she can't get out. So now she has the painful feeling of being trapped. So loneliness, despair, feelings of entrapment, strange, upsetting feelings, because that's the way she's functioning in the family, and that's the way the family is functioning with them, the children. Now, here's my hypothesis for you. However the family imposed that trap, however it was, we know one thing was the result. They were caught and trapped, and they couldn't get out. Enlightenment is trying to get out of every trap. Now, why the down if you want to go up? Now, let me raise a hypothesis for you, all right? The parallel hypothesis. Let's say we have here a line. I want a scale. A scale of intensity. Now, that scale of intensity is indifferent to whether it's pleasure or pain. All we're looking at it in the sense that it will awaken the person to their experience. The experience itself has a, a degree of intensity. So let us say that that's a level of intensity. That's a level of intensity. That's a level of intensity. That's a real level of intensity. One, two, three, four, five, just for the moment. These heightened states of intensity are going to be those times when the child recognized they were trapped and couldn't get out. The degree to which they felt that trap, that jail, that sentence. The reaction from being trapped is despair and loneliness and feelings of being dejected and rejected. Every one of these scenes that produce that state of mind, each one of them, is actually a piece put in place to make sure that you can't get out. Therefore, this scale of enlightenment has its own levels of intensity, and they, in fact, can be charted. Now, these darker, wider lines I have ripped, drawn here on the board, these are enlightenment states, or feeling good or positive about your own progress. To whatever degree of intensity 
that you're moving in terms of your own development, there's a corresponding step and stage And therefore, you're going to have the problems you have to have in order to break through. Whatever level of intensity you experience being trapped and trying to get out, all the pain associated with that trap, each one is connected with a particular time and place. Therefore, when this person, the Canadian housewife, reach these particular levels, that's going to trigger these particular states of mind in her past, and she's going to therefore experience two levels simultaneously, or in, in, immediately in sequence. So, as she reaches these states and she recollects, remember those few lines we read where she recollects, oh yeah, I remember I was in somewhat like this in the past. Remember we called that the recollection scene? See, that's what the mind is doing. You're saying, hey, yes, that's what's going on. You would recollect that in the past for a very good reason. It had the same level of intensity as that early experience in your childhood. Therefore, they're parallel. Therefore, we can make a rather bold statement. We can say, you know what? You can go as high as you can go deep. If you want to go up, then you have to face what put you down. You have to endure it, and you have to continue with going up in this progress so that you can then live through that sense of being trapped and gain your freedom. because there was no trap that you didn't accept. You accepted it, I accepted it, we all accept it. It has no reality other than a belief. Therefore, as you progress in your quest for enlightenment, you are going to experience all of those dreadful states that in the past trapped you and kept you in your trap. There's a difference, however, you see. As a child, we, did, we couldn't understand it. We assumed that that's the way things are and you have to t accept things the way they are because that's, this is, that's the justice, as it were, of our existence. But we're not there anymore. We can understand it. We can see how it relates. We can use our mind. We can expect these things to occur we can even anticipate them. Hey, I'm doing great, watch the fall. Therefore, each one of these past scenes see, has something very important for us. It also damned us, see, it damned up our feelings, it damned up our desires, it damned up, damned up, it enclosed our energy. Therefore, as you break through each one of these, more energy and vitality is now available to you for your own creative purposes. It's no longer entrapped. That's what I call the double hypothesis. Now, Whatever thoughts and images, now she didn't do this for us, but it would be extremely interesting, you see, if we could have had her tell us about what kinds of images and thoughts and feelings occurred down here. What kinds, what were all the thoughts and the images that you had as you got the first sense that you were going down? Can we recall all of that? Can we get that data? If we could, if we could get the actual thoughts, you would see that those thoughts are the very thoughts that you believed that ensured your own captivity. And invariably, those are the thoughts and the images that someone else used to try to persuade you to accept your fate. 
Now, notice, we're not saying whether it was justified or not. We're not blaming or condemning anybody. We're just saying this is what goes on. Therefore, if you seek anything meaningful and significant in your life, as you approach your goal, keep a journal of the thoughts and the images in your mind because it's going to awaken that past struggle. And you can use them to recall it. Like, look here, let me give the one that we used a moment ago. Ah, here it is. On the wrong page. From early childhood, I'll start at the beginning of the paragraph 274. I began to consider that I must be doing something wrong, misdirecting my energy in some way. During the rest period, after the morning lecture, I suddenly realized that this center was where I was being told to put my, put my mind, could only be a certain region long familiar to me. From my early childhood, it was the realm to which I had always retired inwardly in order to reflect. Hey, she had to have a place in her mind to escape. I had built up a whole set of intimate images about it. If I ever wanted to understand the truth of a situation, it was this particular place that I must go to consider such problems, which had to be approached in a childlike frame of mind, free from prejudices. It's to that particular area that I must go to consider such problems. That's what she did when she was a child. So she got that idea. Now, if she could have told us more about that, and when she would go into that, let's see whether we can make one, all right? Here. Here's the place in the house, right here, that she could retire to so she could be alone. And in being alone, she could then get into this certain state of mind in which she could retire inwardly in order to reflect. She's a yogi, see, she had a child, she, she went there. If we could only get her to say, what was going on such that you needed that place? What kinds of thoughts and images came up just before you felt the need that it was time to get into that place, if you could get into it, to reflect inwardly, or to retire inwardly and reflect? If we could get these thoughts, wouldn't it be interesting to know whether those kinds of thoughts that she had as a child were the same kind of thoughts that she had just about that same time? If so, well then you know what we're doing? We're doing something rather interesting in our search. See. The voices within us cry aloud right? with her. See, she, she suffered the unbearable agonies. She went through all of that. If we could have gotten all those thoughts, because she's revisiting the past, as it were, that's still alive in her own soul. She doesn't give us that. She gives us the state of mind. If we could only have had those thoughts, then we could understand it so much better. Because we might be able to put a couple of questions to her. We might say, hey, those voices that uh, are screaming aloud in your head, can you describe the tone, the manner, the style of those voices? Is it possible that might be your mother, your father, your uncle, your aunt, or someone that influenced you so profoundly? Huh? If they are similar, then did you have to believe those things? Did you have to believe that is true? Was that the price of being a member, an accepted member of the family? Well then, if you want out, you're no longer going to abide by those. 
But then you have to face being alone, totally alone, separated from the clan, separated from the family, to create your own independent existence. And that's nearly impossible for a child, but you can do it now. Because we no longer have that dependency and that immaturity. So, the higher you go, the deeper you go. Right? As you handle your basic problems that you inherited, right, the higher. The higher you go, the more you get. So, what do you do? You go in two directions simultaneously. Right? You can go as high as you can go down. You can go up as high as you go down. But if you do, notice though, that what you're doing then is taking the mystery out of that entrapment. In the end then, you are then brought to understand all your conflicts, or the vast number of them. But still, you see, this system that she's in, Zen, doesn't encourage that dimension of understanding as much as perhaps I think it should. Because she concludes her story with a very interesting account of six years later. One spring day, as I was working in the garden, the air seemed to shiver in a strange way, as though the usual sequence of time had opened into a new dimension. And I became aware that something untoward was about to happen. If not that day, then soon. Hoping to prepare in some way for it, I doubled my regular sittings in Zazen and studied Buddhist books late into each night. A few evenings later, after carefully sifting through the Tibetan Book of the Dead, and then taking my bath, I sat in front of a painting of the Buddha and listened quietly by candlelight to the slow movement of Beethoven's A minor quartet. A deep expression of man's self-renunciation then went to bed. The next morning, just after breakfast, I suddenly felt as though I was being struck by a bolt of lightning and I began to tremble. All at once, the whole trauma of my difficult birth flashed into my mind. Like a key, this opened dark rooms of secret resentments and hidden fears, which flowed out of me like poisons. Tears gushed out and so weakened me that I had to lie down. Yet a deep happiness was there. Slowly, my focus changed. I'm dead. There's nothing to call me. There never was a me. It's an allegory, a mental image, a pattern upon which nothing was ever molded. Modeled, pardon me. I grew dizzy with delight. Solid objects appeared as shadow, and everything my eyes fell upon was radiantly beautiful. These words can only hint at what was vividly revealed to me in the days that followed. See? Like a dark room, like dark rooms, Right, that were opened up in secret resentments and hidden fears which flowed out of me like poisons. She's in a state of mind. The higher you go up, the more it opens up your past. The more you then have to find a way to being reconciled with your own existence. Now she gives about nine items, very nice descriptions of what it was like for her after this experience. I want to read a couple. Looking into faces, I see something of the long chain of their past existence, and sometimes something of the future. The past ones recede behind the outer face, like ever finer tissues, yet they're at the same time impregnated in it.
When I am in solitude, I, I can hear a song coming forth from everything. Each and everything has its own song, even moods, thoughts, feelings have their finer songs. Yet beneath this variety, they intermingle into one inexpressibly vast unity. I feel a love which, without object, is best called lovingness. But my old emotional reactions still coarsely interfere with the expressions of that supremely gentle and effortless lovingness. See, she's still aware, right? She's still aware that there are elements of that past that she still has to work through. She's still aware of it. She's now able to work through it to some degree, but she's still aware of their presence. Right. But my old emotional reactions still coarsely interfere with the expressions of this supremely gentle and effortless lovingness. Right. So the higher you go up, the more you're going to have to come to grips with yourself, which is a nice way it is, isn't it? What else do we want to do? to know ourselves, right? So, that's what I wanted to do this evening. Share it with you. And you can do it with yourself. You can practice it. You can do it. You can read works with this idea in mind. The more a person tells you about their inner world, though, the easier it is to chart it if they don't. If it's not available to them, then of course you can't do it. So, thank you.